So let me begin. I'm going to speak about the age of insight and the origins of modernist thought, the quest to understand the unconscious in mind, brain, portraiture, and art. From Vienna 1900 to the present in Provincetown. I should tell you I know both of these cities fairly well. I was born in Vienna and lived there in, until age nine when I was invited to leave. And I came to Provincetown, which was one of the cities that invited me. And I have been here very often. Origins of modernist thought. Modernist thought began in the middle of the 19th century as part of a response to the restrictions and hypocrisies of everyday life, but even more as a reaction to the enlightenment of the 18th century and the excessive emphasis on the rationality of human behavior. Um, the enlightenment or age of reason was characterized by the belief that humans were specially created by God as rational creatures that differed from other living creatures by having their actions guided by reason. These Enlightenment beliefs were inspired by the extraordinary success of the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century. It was argued that the success of this revolution derived from the application of reasoned thinking to the study of the universe by great rational minds such as those of Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. The remarkable achievements of the scientific revolution were celebrated in 1660 with the formation of the Royal Society of London, which Newton became president in 1703. The founders of society thought of God as a mathematician. This is really, I should assure you, not the Jewish conception of God, uh, who designed the universe to operate according to logical mathematical principles. The function of the scientist was to decipher the code book God had used to create the universe. This perspective led to the belief that we live in a rational world in which reasoned and enlightened thought would ultimately lead to a better condition for all humankind. In reacting to the Enlightenment, modernism represented a search for a new worldview, a view partly influenced by Charles Darwin. He argued, humans are not uniquely created, but are biological creatures that have evolved from simple animal ancestors. Evolution is driven by sexual selection so that from an evolutionary perspective, the primary function of a biological organism is to reproduce itself. Since sexual attraction and mate selection are central to the behavior of all animals, sex must be central to human behavior. I'm sure this does not come as a surprise to most of you. The keys to sexual attraction, mate selection, and indeed to all social interactions are facial expressions and the emotions they mediate. In addition to Darwin, modernism has other roots. One modernist root originated in Vienna, an historical period called the Age of Insight. This age has three main features which still characterizes the world we live in today in Provincetown. One, a new view of the human mind as not being rational, but driven by unconscious sexual and aggressive drives. You certainly see this in Provincetown any day you want to. <laughs> the conviction that the search for the rules that govern the nature of the human mind begin with an examination of oneself. It's a very profound insight. And three, a broad attempt to integrate and unify knowledge, an attempt driven by science. One example of this attempted at integration was the initiation of a dialogue between art and science. The dialogue between art and science that originated in modernist thought of Vienna had three phases. One, the independent discovery in Vienna of different aspects of unconscious mental processes by two physicians, Freud and Schnitzler, and three modernist artists, Klimt, Kokoschka, and Schiele, all of whom I will argue were influenced by a common source, Karl von Rokotansky, head of the Vienna School of Medicine. Two, the first attempt to bridge art to science, science of psychology, by three Viennese art historians, Alois Riegel, whom I didn't know, but Ernst Chris and Ernst Garbage, both of whom I knew quite well, and they did it through a focus on the beholder share, that is how the viewer responds to a work of art. A further bridging of art to science was through a biological analysis of the beholder share, an analysis that continues to this day, the first steps of which were taken in the 1950s by the visual physiologist Stephen Kufler, originally of the Vienna School of Medicine. I should emphasize in the beginning that the, the idea of a beholder share is extremely important. So there are two aspects to a work of art. One is that the artist creates it, but two, it is incomplete unless a viewer responds to it. So the whole issue is absolutely critical for appreciating the complex uh, existence of a work of art. 
There were three phases to dialogue relating art and science originating in Vienna 1900. The first phase is medical science and art. Until the beginning of the 18th century, European medicine was in large part pre-scientific. The first steps toward an empirically based medicine were taken in Paris in 1800 as a consequence of the reforms initiated by the revolution. But by the 1840s, the momentum of French creativity in medicine began to decline. The focus now shifted from Paris to Vienna, its university, the medical school, and its hospital, the Allgemeine Wiener Krankenhaus. Uh, Maria Theresia, who was the Queen of Austria-Hungary, realized that you can't have a great army unless you have wonderful medical care for them. And she recruited Gerd from Sweden, an outstanding physician from Sweden, to uh, begin to provide that. Uh, Maria Theresa's successor, Joseph II, extended that and built a general hospital in Vienna that actually became quite famous and got major people, Karl von Kotansky and Theodor Bilroth, to run that hospital. Karl von Kotansky was particularly important because he realized before one can treat, one must have an accurate diagnosis. This has never dawned on anyone before Kotansky came along because accurate diagnoses were not possible uh, before 1850. And he began to focus on that. We must examine the patient carefully to see what is going on. Um, and he got a, an outstanding clinician by the name of Josef Skoda to take this on. So before they did an autopsy on anybody, they saw that as the patient was weakening, they did very careful physical workups to have a clinical description of what was wrong with them. So when they did the autopsy, they could relate abnormalities that they saw in the body to the physiological abnormalities they saw in the living patient. Well, Katansky's contributions were several fold. One, he provided the basis for modern scientific medicine through a systematic clinical pathological correlation. So this was the first time to begin to systematically correlate what was wrong with the patient that you could actually detect on physical examination while the patient was alive, and then when the patient died, to do an autopsy on the patient to see can you correlate any of those physiological symptoms with what you see at autopsy. Emphasizing the principle of truth often was hidden below the surface. You had to do an autopsy in order to get some insight into what was going on in the living patient. And train some of the leaders of academic medicine, what Katansky did, including Freud. Uh, in fact, when Freud died, several of the obituaries said Freud would not have been as insightful and creative a person if he hadn't been originally trained by Rokotansky. Rokotansky also recruited world-leading clinicians, including Theodor Bilroth. Freud was one of the people influenced by him. He was a fine biologist who pioneered the unconscious study of the mind and attempted to relate it to biology. I don't know whether you realize this, but Sigmund Freud was really quite an outstanding neuroanatomist and made important contributions to the anatomy of the brain before he turned to psychological uh, issues that fascinated him more. Freud's three-step plan for developing a platform for future biological analysis of mental processes based on a scientific psychology. This was really the first cognitive psychology. There was the observable behavior, then there was the interpretation, the psychoanalysis, the dynamic scientific psychology, which was mostly interpretive because one had no direct way to do it, and ultimately, one would look in the brain to see what was going on, but that was really not something they could do at that particular point, because first of all, they didn't do that many autopsies in the brain, and number two, they didn't have the tools to really analyze the dead brain in a meaningful way. Freud's scientific contribution to cognitive psychology are based on three key ideas. One, that human beings are not rational creatures, they are driven by irrational unconscious mental processes. That's an extremely profound insight. Other people had hinted it, but Freud spelled that out more clearly than anyone before him. That adult character, including unconscious sexuality and aggression, could be traced to the ma uh, mind of a child. One doesn't realize it often, but young kids, four, five, six years old, begin to show aspects of sexual urges of various kinds, and certainly obvious that they show aggressive urges of various kinds. No mental event occurs by chance. Mental events adhere to scientific laws and follow the principles of psychic determinism. That's another very important idea, that just because it's mental and it looks like it's complicated doesn't mean there isn't a coherent, logical set of principles underlying it. As a result of his contribution, Freud has emerged as a major source of a modern Rokotanskian inclination to look for meaning 
beneath the surface of behavior. However, there were certain important aspects of the human psyche that Freud failed to notice that other Viennese modernists did. And the most important thing that he failed to notice is female sexuality. Do you know why he didn't have profound insights into female sexuality? He had experience with amazingly few women. It is discussed whether or not he had an affair with a sister-in-law when they were on holiday together. But beyond that, it's thought that he was faithful to his wife throughout the whole marriage. Unlike other of his contemporaries, who were really extremely promiscuous and therefore had more a detailed insight into female sexuality. One of these people who had this insight was Gustav Klimt. And he was the painter of the unconscious. He achieved a post darwinian breakthrough in the liberation of female sexuality. So he not only was able to draw women uh, in, in, in nude attire, but was able to show that women can satisfy themselves sexually uh, and did this in a very elegant way. Uh, and you could also see the major introduction Klimt made in the perception of female sexuality. If you look at the history of the nude in Western art, they're all focused on the beholder. The women all looked out at the canvas to the person looking at the portrait, as if the only function of the work of art was to satisfy the sexual curiosity of the beholder. You see this with Giorgione, you see this with Titian, you see this with Goya, you see this with Manet. Not only are they looking out at the beholder as if the beholder's satisfaction, his erotic curiosity, is the only thing that's important for them, but in three cases out of four, they have their left hand over their vagina. And it isn't at all clear whether this is designed for modesty or that they're pleasuring themselves. But if you look at Klimt, the woman it doesn't look out at you, she's pleasing herself, and there's no question in anybody's mind this woman is satisfying herself. She's not interested in your satisfaction in the slightest. So um, the liberation of female sexuality carried with it the capability of also freeing aggression and fusing it with sexuality. This was really very important. This was one of Klimt's insights. He realized that just as men have erotic instincts in addition to aggressive ones and can fuse them and often do, so do women. Uh, and he did this uh, in a particularly uh, elegant painting, Clint did this, of Judith and Holofernes. You know the story. Uh, uh, Holofernes carried out, a, he's an Assyrian, carried out a siege over a small village right near Jerusalem. And uh, Judith realized that uh, this was going to go on for a long period of time. So she went out from this besieged area and found Holofernes, who was celebrating at a party and drinking quite heavily. She encouraged him to drink more, and when he was really quite drunk and had actually had some sex with her and was exhausted, she took a sword off the wall of his tent and chopped his head off. This, is, this has been conveyed and portrayed on many works of art, and usually the woman is, who is doing this, uh, Judith, does this out of a sacrifice for her people. She gets absolutely no satisfaction out of this brutal act. But this is not the way Klimt does it. Klimt gets the uh, sensuality out of aggression, makes it clear that Judith is having a wonderful time with the head of Holofernes, fondling it with great pleasure. So this really shows the liberation of female sexuality, carries with it the capability of also freeing aggression and fusing aggression with sexuality. So women can fuse aggression with sexuality, as many of you probably have experienced, as well, if not better, than men can do it. How did Rokotansky, who influenced Freud, influence Klimt? Turns out that um, Rokotansky had an associate whose name was Emil Zuckerkandl, and Emil Zuckerkandl had a wife, Bertha Zuckerkandl, who ran a salon. And in Vienna, life began, the intellectual life began in Bertha Zuckerkandl's salon. If you were not invited to Bertha Zuckerkandl's salon, you were nobody. Anybody here not invited to Bertha Zuckerkandl's salon? <laughs> Thank you. She was really remarkable. Uh, and in, in, in his salon, people learned not only uh, from each other, because they talked to each other, but they learned from her about art and, and from her husband about science. And they began to convey this into, into an artwork. 
And Gustav Klimt, who came to us alone, did this wonderful painting of Zeus coming to the end in a shower of golden raindrops. And you see this very famous myth being recreated, but you also notice there are two kinds of symbols. Number one, this rectangular symbol is a symbol for what? For sperm. And you see this time and time again in Klimt's paintings. And these circular uh, uh, symbols are symbols of ova. So you see that the potential for fertilization is depicted uh, in this painting. And in the kiss, you see the same thing. This is Klimt's the kiss. You see the man, his coat is decorated by these rectangular symbols, which is sperm. And her gown is decorated by these circular symbols, which uh, symbolize uh, the ovum. Kokoschka moved Viennese art from uh, Klimt's declarative art nouveau style to expressionism. And he developed three major themes. One, a major interest in going below the surface to explore the emotional life of his subjects. An emphasis on hands as a way of conveying emotion in a very powerful way, and a fascination with child and adolescent sexuality. Kokoschka realized that sexual curiosity and sexual interest does not begin, you know, when, when people are in their 15, 16 years old, it begins much, much earlier. Young kids, three, four, five years old, begin to show sexual curiosity. Uh, and Klimt's decorative Art Nouveau style was carried further by him. You see in Klimt, for example, that many of his elegant gowns, in fact, have uh, quite clear-cut erotic symbolisms. You, you see the Adele Bloch-Bauer painting here. If you look at the middle of a dress, you see this um, typical oval symbols, which symbolize eggs over, and the rectangular ones, which symbolize sperm. Kokoschka's expressionism, next step, a, a, in an unarticulated background, he uses color in a very arbitrary way, not to convey reality, but to convey emotion. And this is extremely powerful. Klimt himself never did a self-portrait. Kokoschka did several self-portraits and argued that self-analysis, the best way to learn about psyche, this is really a contemporary of Freud and thinking very much along the same line. Freud spent a half an hour each day at the end of his therapy sessions analyzing himself because he felt that unless he understood himself, he really could not be useful to others. Kokoschka did several self-portraits and argued self-analysis is the best way to learn about the psyche. This was independent of Freud. And he used body gestures and hand position to communicate inner feelings. Um, and he had fantastic insights into people. He did a very famous painting of August Farrell, who was a professor of psychiatry at the University of Zurich and director of Berkholsky, the famous psychiatric institute. Um, and when he was finished with the painting, uh, the people who had uh, proposed that he uh, paint the painting, that Kokoschka paint this painting, were unhappy with it. They said, look, the way his hand is, it really it doesn't look very good. And the fact is, that this guy, within two months, had a stroke. And as a result of that stroke, his arm was paralyzed, and this is exactly the way he looked all the time. Uh, and what Kokoschka had picked up in an early sign was an occasion in which the precursor of the stroke, the constriction of the blood vessels, was already in action, and you could see this. So an amazing insight. And he actually said, I could have foretold the future life of many of my sitters of, uh, by just watching the way they act. Uh, and he also, he was the first person, Kokoschka, to uh, depict female adolescent nudes. And he did this in a very uh, elegant way. Uh, but he also indicated that even younger children have erotic curiosity. And he depicted the Stein children, Lottie and Walter, playing together on the floor. And I think there's an absolutely fantastic picture. They're clearly attracted to each other on some level, but she has formed a fist with the right hand and she's ready to punch Walter if he goes a little bit too far. He's pulling at her left arm with his left hand, but that's the limit she's going to allow him to go. If he goes any further, wham, she's going to hit him right in the schnazu. So, but it makes it clear that there is no childhood <coughs> innocence, that even children have sexual curiosities and erotic instincts that forms their feeling states and their interaction with each other, both erotic and aggressive. Sheila 
use not only simple face and hands, but also the total self, the whole body, as an object for exploring the existential anxiety of modern life, an exploration that is best done in the nude. Um, he did many paintings of himself in love positions of various kinds, and while these two people are making love, they look frightened to death. So indicating the existential anxiety of modern life affects even the erotic life of everyday people. Uh, he also introduced the male nude in Western art and made many, many pictures of himself and of others. Klimt himself did no uh, self-portraits. Kokoschka did a few. But Sheely, between 1910 and 1911, painted about 100 self-portraits, many of them in the nude. And some of Sheely's self-portraits are so provocative designed to be really confrontational. Here he is looking straight at you, masturbating. This is because he felt he didn't want to be outdone by Klimt, who had women masturbating. He wanted to show men could also masturbate, and he used himself as an object of doing that. This is not something that most painters would be thinking of doing. So there are three phases of dialogue relating art and science originating in Vienna. The second phase of psychology and art, the beholder share. Um, Alois Riegel was the first art historian who attempted to bridge science to art. He argued art, particularly post-Renaissance art, invited the fewest participation. He now saw the beholder share as a key problem to focus on for a scientific approach to art because the beholder's response is essential for the completion of the picture. This challenge was taken up by two great disciples, Ernst Chris and Ernst Gombrich, both of whom I knew slightly. But let me just emphasize how important this is. Uh, when a painter paints a painting, he is the creative artist that does the, the work of art. But the painting has no meaning whatsoever unless other people see it and respond to it. So the whole the share, that is, that's why it's called a share, is what completes the painting, the fact that it's there not only for the painter to create it as a work of art, but for other people to see it as beholders and respond to it. And exactly how they respond to a work of art and how they respond differently to different works of art is something that really fascinated uh, Chris and Gombrich a great deal. Ernst Chris, whom I actually knew quite well, uh, said great art is ambiguous. Ambiguity allows for alternative views on a part of different beholders, and these differences in the beholder's response reveal creativity in the beholder's share. So the fact is, when the first two rows here and I look at the same work of art, each of us will have a slightly different interpretive response to it. That means each of us is undergoing a slightly different creative response to a work of art. So what is often not realized is the creativity involved in the beholder, not just in the painting. I mean, it's a more modest creativity, but significant creativity nevertheless. Um, Ernst Chris was really, really quite remarkable because he later on to become a major psychoanalyst, but he started off as a major art historian, one of Vienna's outstanding art historians. So he made the point that the beholder recapitulates in his own brain a creative process which in a modest way parallels that of the artist. Ernst Gombrich said illusion is a way of, to study creativity in the beholder's response. When you create an illusion and you see how the beholder responds when there are many different opportunities for response, if you really learn a great deal about the perception of the beholder. So the visual brain of the beholder is a creativity machine. There's a, and you need a visual psychology or visual perception. And it's influenced by Berkeley and the inverse optics problem and by Hermann Helholtz and bottom-up and top-down processing, the reconstructive nature of vision. And the delusions are evident in the failure of this veridical construction. Let me give you an example. Uh, look at this black square here. Do all of you see the black square? Please raise your hand. I just want to make sure all of you are seeing it. Nonsense! <laughs> you are making it up. It simply is not there. If you turn these shapes around, you will see that you have filled in an empty black square where there was nothing there. So this is a productive, unconscious creation of a square on top of this. And this is what your visual brain is doing all the time. And that's why you get fooled under many, many circumstances. So be careful whom you go out with. Be careful whom you marry. You may be <laughs> misperceiving, but you actually have been interacting with on a regular basis.
Chris and Garbage, the three-step analysis of the beholders share, perception, emotion, empathy, and art. Uh, beholders share, so the beholders' behavior, cognitive psychology, mental representation of perception, emotion, empathy, and brain mechanism. The brain mechanisms of perception, emotion, empathy. So there were, I said there were three phases of the dialogue, dialogue relating art and science of Virginia Vanda. The third phase is biology and art. What are the brain mechanisms underlying the beholders share? The flow diagram for neural circuit involved the beholders share of a portrait. This is highly simplified. Take a look at another person's face. There's an analysis of the facial contour, representation of the facial details that occurs in the infratemporal cortex and the amygdala, representation of the body, which occurs in the extra striate body area, analysis of the body in motion, if it's in motion, which occurs in two superior temporal uh, uh, cortex, action stimulation, if there's actually action occurring, inferior parietal cortex, inferior frontal cortex, and mental stimulation, temporal parietal cortex and psychological insight into the other person. So many areas of the brain are recruited when you actually interact with another person from a perceptual point of view. Analysis of facial contour of a portrait, the psychological response. So the magic of a portrait, of all the objects in the world, faces are special. As Darwin pointed out, faces are essential for social interactions. We recognize others and even ourselves by means of the face, and we use the face to communicate emotion to find a partner. Faces are treated differently by the brain from all other objects. It automatically treats the brain as it's very, very special. Faces are particularly difficult for computers to recognize, but the brain recognizes it with enormous facility. We can recognize a line drawing of Rembrandt's self-portrait, and slight exaggeration helps you recognize it even more. So this is a wonderful thing about exaggeration. It tremendously facilitates the ability to recognize something. And one of the things is that face recognition is uniquely sensitive to inversion. You see these two images of the Mona Lisa. Do you see them clearly? Raise your hand if you all see them clearly. Do you see that they're identical? Good for you. Brilliant. They're not quite identical. Many in audience, not in Provincetown, but in many other cities of the United States would not be able to make this distinction. You can see that she is quite different. But it's very hard to tell these subtle differences in faces when they're upside down. How do we respond biologically to a portrait? Here's a flow diagram of the neural circuit involved in the beholder share. Representation of faces in a portrait and the biological mechanism. Another person's face, there's analysis of the facial contour. Representation of the faces occurs in the infratemporal cortex and the amygdala. A representation of the body, extra striate body area, Analysis of the body in motion, superior temporal sulcus, motion simulation, inferior parietal cortex, inferior frontal cortex, mental simulation, temporal parietal cortex, and psychological insight into another person. So many areas of the brain get recruited for the mere perception of another person because you're not just perceiving the body form, but also the facial expression, that you're nodding your head, that you're listening, et cetera, et cetera, that is being recorded by different subsystems of the brain, all of whom have to be coordinated together. <coughs> so representation of the face in the infratemporal cortex. There's a special recognition area of face which was first realized in 1947 by Johann Bottom. He found something called prosopagnosia, that is people who can recognize that there's a face there but cannot recognize which face it is. It's face blindness. And Chuck Close, there were famous artists who were face blind. And many of them mastered this by taking a photograph of the person they're going to paint and then using that photograph as a template for starting to paint the top of that. Uh, this is simply to show you that there's the frontal cortex, the parietal cortex, the exceptional cortex, and the temporal lobe. And this is where visual, uh, the visual representation of faces occurs. So this is information comes in in the, in the back of the brain, which is the occipital pole, which is concerned with visual perception. And then this area in the posterior inferior cortex uh, it presents a more detailed representation of the face. And there are some people who actually have a deficit in this pathway. And they can see faces, but they can't make out who they are. And some great artists, including Chuck Close and Oliver Sacks, Oliver Sacks was not a great artist, but Chuck Close couldn't recognize faces individually. And the way they ended up 
painting them is to take a photograph and use that as a template and paint on top of the photograph because their own visual system wasn't susceptible to really detecting subtle differences between faces. There are face patches in the inferior temporal cortex one can show in humans and in monkeys that if you can record from single cells, there are little clusters of cells that respond to faces. Uh, and you do this by combining brain imaging with single cell recording. And if you do this, for example, this is a monkey, and you show a monkey a monkey, your cells in the infratemporal cortex go brrrr. If you show a cartoon of the monkey, which is simplified, it fires even more because you've exaggerated it. These are the main features, doesn't need the modes. But if you drop out the mouth, boom, you're dead. No longer responds. Drop out the eyes, you have only mouth, nothing. You need to have at least this part, but this part gives you an exaggerated response because that is the key features by which faces are recognized. How do we respond biologically to a portrait? This is a flow diagram of the neural circuit involved in the social brain and the beholder share. Another person's face, an analysis of facial contour, representation of the face. This occurs in the infratemporal cortex and the amygdala. The allocentric representation of the body, extra striped body area. Analysis of the body when it moves, superior temporal cortex, simulation like me, inferior parietal cortex, inferior frontal cortex, theory of the mind, temporal parietal cortex, and psychological insight into another person. So when you just interact with another person, it occupies an enormous amount of your brain. So be careful in the friends that you select because each of them puts a great demand on the cognitive capability of your brain. Uh, body motion, biological motion, mirroring motion, and theory of mind are represented by different areas uh, in this schema. And there's a regional localization of brain area involved in the behavioral response. The body motion, biological motion, mirroring motion, and empathy and theory of mind. This simply to show you. This is the stride cortex where visual information first comes in. It's then processed in the inferior temporal cortex, which is particularly strong in face processing, and lateral occipital cortex, which gives you visual and tactile interaction. Extra striped body area attaches details of the body. Then motion processing is located right here in V5. Superior temporal sulcus is concerned with biological motion. Parietal mirror neuron area it is involved in mirror action of the body. And then there is action area that's concerned with theory of mind, which tries to guess by looking at your face what's going on in your head. And this is a frontal mirror area that has a parallel function. There's a region localization brain areas that specifically involve the beholder's response to emotion depicted in, in uh, portraiture. So for example, we see in the amygdala an orchestrator of emotion, and we see a dopamine, a modulator of emotion. So when you have an emotional response, it recruits a number of different areas. Each of them is contributing their own very specific aspect to the emotional response. And a lot of that has been worked out in the last 10 or 15 years. Emotions can be fused, a merger of erotic and aggressive emotion. And the question is, how is this fusion represented in the brain? It turns out the amygdala, structure deep in the brain, is an orchestrator of emotion and it communicates with the hypothalamus. And there are circuits within the ventromedial hypothalamus that control mating on the one hand and aggression on the other. And David Anderson found that the ventromedial hypothalamus contains a distinct population of neurons, about 20% of the to uh, total, that is active both doing mating and doing aggression. And you can now see how mating and aggression can easily flip from one to the other, because in, in, in addition to having independent populations of cells, they're concerned only with one and not with the other. You have a population of cells that is concerned with both. This suggests that the circuitry for these behaviors are intimately linked in the brain is Klimt revealed so clearly here. In Judith and Holofernes, he shows how Judith, having chopped off the head of Holofernes in this act which she did to save her people, gets enormous sensual pleasure out of this. She holds his head fondly, her eyes are partially closed, she really is in a post-coital trance. This is not a woman who's committed a horrible deed of chopping off the head of a man. This is a woman who's gotten tremendous sexual satisfaction of helping her people. 
how can erotic infighting two mutually exclusive behaviors reinforce each other? And that is the hypothalamus structure deep in the brain, which is critical for emotion, contains overlapping population of neurons acting doing erotic mating behavior and fighting behavior. So there are fighting neurons and they're mating neurons. And in between, they're mixed. And you can see when you're making love to your partner, how sometimes the partner will punch you accidentally or otherwise. And that's because the fighting representation and the mating representation are so coextensive that there is an overlap and cells can be appropriately, inappropriately recruited for the other action. Activation of hypothalamic neurons of different intensities can evoke either fighting or mating. So a weak stimulus leads to mating and a strong stimulus meets the fighting. So when you're making love to your love object, be sure that you keep it toned down. If it gets too strong, it might lead to fighting. This is a fusion of Freud, Clinton, Shealy, and the new science of mind. So finally, can brain science reveal something about the love of arts? What accounts for Arnold Lauder's love of Viennese modern art? This lovely Adele Bochbauer that he spent $100 million for. One is the orbital frontal cortex, which is critically involved, but also the modulatory systems of the brain are very important. And something like the dopamine modulatory system acts on many areas of the brain to uh, facilitate the perception and the action that that area is involved with. So primary rewards, food, sex, and drink, addiction, romantic love, love of art, all act on the modulatory system uh, that releases dopamine, and the dopamine system acts on representation of faces, allocentric representation of the body, analysis of body motion, and theory of mind, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and activates those regions in, its, in a systematic way so they act in a coherent pattern to give you the action that you need. So Ronald Lauder's love of Viennese and modernist art, like this love of Adele Bachbauer, is due to the fact that there is a strong attraction that he felt for this painting. He saw it the first time, he loved it. Every time he saw it, it made him even greater. So it really changed his brain. He, every time he saw it, he became more addicted to it. And ultimately, he had to buy the painting. He had no other choice. <laughs> so to conclude, the greatest enterprise for the human mind has been and always will be uh, the attempt at linkages between brain science and the humanities. This is Wilson's comment uh, from Consilience. The Viennese moderns were the first work to, uh, to, uh, to work to establish the linkages between art and science by focusing on the beholder share. And the pioneering attempt in this great enterprise continues in Provincetown, but the spirit of modernism is carried forward to this day, as you will see not in this talk, but in the next talk. Eric asked me to join him here today. I was very pleased because our paths had um, met about a decade ago as I was researching uh, the art of Gustav Klimt and I stumbled across his connections to uh, the University of Vienna Medical School and that was because I was also working on the figure of Berta Zucker Kandel who held this extraordinary salon in Vienna. So um, my job today following Eric is I wanted to zoom in on his chief themes through the work of Gustav Klimt and redouble these ideas about the influence of the University of Vienna Medical School, the influence of the Vienna School of Art Historians on Klimt, who was right in the middle of these two phenomenal intellectual developments at the time, and also show the connections between the two deeply written into Klimt's work of Darwin's theory of evolutionary biology. So I'm showing you Klimt's uh, mural, one of three he did for the University of Vienna. Uh, at that time, he was commissioned to do them. And this is uh, the second one, Medicine. And on the right, Barbara Kruger's famous work, Your Body is a Battleground. Uh, my point is not to be political at the moment, but simply to point out that the female body was also a battleground in Fin de Siècle Vienna because of the new interpretation that Darwin brought to bear on human nature in general, as we've just heard from Dr. Kandel, and how it was no longer God or reason, but the sexual drive, the drive to procreation, which led uh, 
Klimt to investigate female sexuality and depict the body, both male and female, but primarily female. You only see the male body in the murals in such a way that critics of this mural would call it suitable for being hung in a gynecologist's office. That's what they said uh, when it was painted in the first decade of the 20th century. So how does Klimt relate to uh, Darwin's theory of evolutionary biology and how does he relate to the Vienna School of Medicine and also um, to the Vienna School of Art Historians? I'm showing you two works that um, are at antipodes sim seemingly on the left, one from his Water Snakes series where you see these uh, pearlescent nude figures of women and their long flowing tresses. Two by the way, two characteristics that Darwin emphasized when it came to the human species of nat natural selection where the female was the one who had the attributes of a sexual attraction as opposed to lower in the animal kingdom where the male often was the more beautiful of the species. But long tresses and hairless body was something that Darwin attributed to um, natural selection and sexual attraction in a, the advancement of the human a form, and you'll notice, um, as Eric's already pointed out, these chromosomal divisions, these circles with the two bars inside, which adorn part of this body. And of course, we have the theme of sexual, uh, of lesbianism or sexual uh, hermaphroditism, which we'll see in Klimt's work as well. So this, what seemingly seems to be a kind of um, basic biological uh, sexuality envisioned in the work on the left, including another kind of water. Uh, serpent or uh, amphibian-like shape on the lower right, next to this portrait of Elizabeth Lederer, who was the daughter of Klimt's most important patron. And this uh, picture on the right embodies a whole other series of works by Klimt's, which are society portraits of Viennese patrons of the time. And she's not nude, she's clothed in a kind of French couture dress. She's wearing an extraordinarily ornamented um, cloak behind her and is surrounded by these chinoiserie figures. So we have a kind of variety of ornament in these two works, which is quite spectacular. And when we think of modernist art, we often think of it as being about flattened spaces and an ornamental quality in the case of the Viennese and Jungen style. And here you see these pictorial surfaces of Klimt immersed in different types of ornament, uh, snakeskin-like uh, demarcations on the left, filaments, um, gem-like circles, star-like forms, or on the right, uh, geometric and um, floral arrangements, and again, this chinoiserie uh, decor. So Klimt is not only picturing decoration, but he's actually picturing a narrative of ornament, which we'll see is directly linked uh, to Darwin's theory of evolution as well. So how does Klimt come to his understanding of Darwin? Well, he is, aside from reading uh, Darwin and his disciples in Vienna, he's uh, directly connected to Berta Zuckerkandl. Not only did he come regularly to her salons in Vienna, uh, but she was um, one of the very few art critics at that time anywhere in the Western world. She had her own byline. This was rare for a woman. Um, women, female journalists were just beginning, but to actually be a female art critic and have your own byline, there was only one other critic at the time, and that was Margarita Sarfatti in Italy who um, some of you might know became, was Jewish, like Zucker Candle, but Sarfati became Mussolini's mistress um, for 20 years. In any event, she was a feminist, or what the Austrians would call uh, a progressive, and uh, Klimt, she championed Klimt in the press, including when the University of Vienna rejected the murals that you just saw. And she was, uh, her fierceness, she said, my pen is my weapon, she was one of three uh, memorialized in these characters of the three leading critics in Vienna at the time, Hermann Bahr and also Ludwig Havesi. These were the three uh, most prominent critics of the Vienna Secession and the Wiener Werkstätte. Many of you have heard of those movements that led the Vienna art scene. Um, Zucker Candle was the daughter of Moritz Scheps, a Hungarian who came to Vienna. Vienna, remember, was a multicultural center, the gateway, as it was said, between West and East. And he ran the Viennese uh, Neue Wiener Tagblatt. That's a caricature of him. And this is um, Berta uh, painted by Eugène Carrier, Rodin's favorite painter in France, and her sister Sophie on the right. Uh, Sophie married uh, the brother of Georges Clemenceau. And together the two women had these Paris 
um, Vienna axis of power, cultural power and uh, intellectual power between the two countries. So who came to her salon? Um, Joseph Hoffman, the architect, Arthur Schnitzler, you all know him as a, 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 as a, a novelist, uh, Gustav Mahler and um, Alma Schlindler, uh, who, of course, Mahler and Alma Mahler would eventually marry. And uh, this was a center not only for music and the arts and design, but also, of course, the scientists of the Vienna Medical School. And that's because Berta was married to Emil, a foremost anatomist. I think there's still a bone, isn't there, named the Zucker Candle Bone, somewhere in the nose, named after him. Um, and um, Berta wrote about her husband in her um, uh, autobiography, claiming that he was the first University of Vienna uh, medical professor to hire women as research assistants just after women were admitted into the medical school in 1900. And just to give you some of the other luminaries, of course, Eric has already shown these, um, but uh, Arthur Schnitzler, I want to remind you, was a doctor himself and the son of a doctor, both of whom were at the University of Vienna, a medical school. And Zucker Candle was, like many other doctors at the University of Medi uh, Vienna Medical School, a champion of Darwin's theory. And there was a huge amount of uh, opposition in Austria to Darwinian evolutionary biology. Why? Because it was a Catholic country. And uh, Catholicism in the church in general was overwhelmingly threatened by Darwin's theories. And indeed, um, uh, Klimt's murals were rejected by the University of Vienna. Uh, they were not considered noble enough. They were uh, uh, considered shockingly brutal with regard to uh, procreation and depictions of the human form. I'm showing philosophy on the left and, again, medicine on the right. Now, if you look closely at medicine, you'll see uh, the female is rising on the left, and she has uh, this uh, fluid form beneath her. It was identified at the time by Ludwig Hervesi as uh, the uterine sac, which contained an embryo or a late-stage embryo in it. And I'm just showing you a detail in color on the bottom of uh, Hygieia. Uh, who is symbolized, notice the slate-like biomorphic forms, these origins of all life in not only the, the, the embryonic fluid itself, but also the ocean, the theory that life originated from the ocean. And uh, it, it's shocking to think, well, one understands why Klimt's mural shocked, because it was a complete inversion of Michelangelo's uh, um, uh, genesis, where uh, Christ is touching Adam, giving birth to man, creating man, if you will. And in Klimt's mural, uh, this woman's partner or man is reaching out to her in vain. He's part of this chain of growth, life, and death. There's death depicted in the skeleton in the middle, meaning that uh, really man has no, con humankind has no um, control over uh, its fate. It's simply an endless cycle of birth sex, procreation, and eventual biological decay. In other words, biology is at the basis of all human life and all human drives. Now, Klimt was influenced um, in his approach uh, to incorporate Darwin's evolutionary biology in his work by reading Darwin's main proponent in Austria, a scientist named Ernst Haeckel. And uh, I'm just showing you Haeckel's depiction of the human fetus with the same, almost this ethereal uh, uterine sac depicted, which we're gonna see again and again in Klimt's work. Here's another example in the three stages of women. Um, and uh, you can see how the blue, he depicts the uterine sac blue, again, to allude to fluid, to embryonic fluid. The child coming out almost like an umbilical cord, you can see, tying that uterine sac to the baby that she clutches uh, closely to her. Now, what's interesting about Klimt is that, um, and, and, and uh, Eric showed you the, the images of the women masturbating. He had women come to his studio all the time. He, he uh, fathered 14 children out of wedlock. Um, and some of these pictures, you know, people have not been happy. They, can't, they consider them voyeuristic. Uh, they're very explicit in their depictions of women pleasuring themselves. And when I came to Klimt's work, um, the foremost uh, opinion, with very few exceptions, was that he was a misogynist. And looking at his pictures, um, I thought, it's not that simple, uh, because there's something else going on here. Uh, and 
as we can see, it's very uh, connected to Darwinian evolutionary biology and uh, theory, as Eric has shown, of, uh, of uh, psychology and psychiatry at the time, and studies that are emerging in the late 19th century pertaining to human sexuality. So we have to put it in the context of its time um, as well. For example, Klimt's Hope, 1903. Do you all remember Demi Moore's cover of the Vanity Fair when she posed? Well, it was old news. I mean, Klimt did this in 1903, pubic hair and all. And who champed this? This picture was removed at one point when it was first exhibited or was not allowed to be shown. And about uh, 10 years later, Berta Zuckerkandel, of all people, a woman, comes to this painting's defense. And she says, it's a, this picture is about a woman contemplating the immense process going on inside of her. And also, what's the issue with depicting her uh, naked and pregnant? It's natural. Those were Zucker Candle's terms. It's natural. She said, go back to the history of, 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 you, of Christian art. The patina of old age gets it past the censors. So let's not be squeamish here. This is, this is natural. So what is this immense process going on inside of her? Well, people were kind of flummoxed by this black, squiggly object with the prehensile claw. You can all see that on the left. Referring to it as a monster of some kind. Here we have the same depiction of this embryonic blue fluid surrounding her. Um, and this is nothing less than um, Klimt's depiction of uh, the human embryo, which at the time, th because of Ernst Haeckel's theory, um, there was this idea that ontology recapitulates philology, meaning that the development of the human embryo recapitulated every stage of the development of the origin of the species, from this tadpole shape to mammalian forms to the human form. And you can even see that the hand referring to the claw in this, um, what's really a hybrid in Klimt's picture of tadpole uh, meets um, a kind of uh, further evolved species, but it's a reference to this development of the immense process that's going on inside of her. And of course the specter of death above her is uh, an objective uh, uh, reference to the number of women who were still dying in childbirth, although by this time people knew to wash their hands, correct? <laughs> so that incident was down. And this is a book that Klimt had in his library, The Illustrated Hi History of Animals, uh, where um, he also incorporates uh, the stingray form, again, a lower level of, in of life uh, into his depiction of this embryonic-like being. His painting, Nude Veritas, again shocked people, not because of, uh, that, uh, of his depiction of the nude, but because of his depiction of nakedness. So after Klimt, uh, it's no longer about the nude, it's about the naked female body in all of its biological uh, reality. And she, by the way, holds up a mirror to you so that you see yourself reflected in this fact that you too uh, uh, came from a, a lower life form and you too will die because that is your, the, the nature of biological determinism. The, at her feet, in addition to the, to the snake, which is no longer really about Adam and Eve, but about, again, these lower vertebrae forms from which a humankind evolves, are these two dandelions um, emitting their seeds as a, a form of growth as well. And in many of Klimt's uh, depictions of these water serpent-like figures, he was dependent on Heckel's uh, radiolarian atlas. This was Heckel's depictions of these single cell organisms that are found in oceanic life, again perceived as the origins of all species. Now, um, Klimt had access to uh, microscopes because uh, 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 Zuckercandle let him in, and uh, Berta Zuckercandle instead recounts that her husband gave a lecture on art which Klimt helped organize. And what um, I'm not showing you one of the lantern slides that Zucker Candle uses, used at that time. The Viennese invented the lantern slide, the whole projection method that we use in art history, now replaced by digital. But she describes it that he took specimens of tissue and put them between glasses and had those photographs, and that's what he's projecting. And she describes uh, his lecture and how he created art forms in nature. Um, at the make-believe world of deep sea nereids seen uh, through a microscope. So here we see that dovetailing what Klimt was doing. He was looking through Heckel, he was looking through the microscope, and he was seeing this marvelous world that was created by this ability to see um, the minute structure of organic tissues. Uh, and as Eric's already pointed out, the um, uh, 
ovoid forms, uh, which include a circle within a circle, are direct references to the human eggs of the ovaries of females. This is another illustration from Heckel on the upper left. Now, I'm just going to shift gears, and I'm not going to talk for much longer, but I wanted now to bring us into the University, uh, the Vienna School of Art Historians. This is a third mural by um, uh, Klimt, the university mural, which I mentioned they were all rejected, uh, even though Emil Zucker Candle defended them. Uh, they were bought by the Lederer family. I showed you the portrait of Elizabeth Lederer. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, the reason you're only seeing them in black and white is because along with many other Klimt pictures, because the letters were Jewish, they were taken by the Nazis in 1938, and then when the war broke out, they, uh, the Zucker candle pictures, along with other treasures from the Belvedere Museum, were taken to eastern Austria for safekeeping in a castle, and that castle was burned to the ground when the Russians approached. It was either burned by the Russians or the Germans, we still don't know. Um, so if in this third mural, Jurisprudence, we see on the bottom um, a man at the dock, in, in, enveloped in one of these octopus, the most primeval form of life, and the Furies, this kind of violent vendetta form of justice. And on the top, we see um, a detail of justice herself. And you'll notice how we've, um, the, Klimt varies the ornament uh, from these um, sort of heckle-like uh, single cell organisms of the sea and the allusions to snakes and earlier forms of vertebrae to the top where justice is depicted in geometric style ornaments. So now we're going to see how in his own works he gives a narrative of the development of ornament in the history of art uh, from its biological origins to its geometric style and beyond. And this was one of the subjects of Regal, whom we heard about earlier, this great art historian of the Vienna School. He wrote a whole book on the history of ornament. And in it, he wrote that the first linear style, uh, earlier mankind, when they first, its first aesthetic impulse was to create tri a line and then triangles and squares. Uh, and so Klimt is deliberately referring to Regal, whose writings he would have known and whose lectures he could have gone to. And furthermore, Klimt's background was as a decorative artist. And Regal began as the curator of decorative arts in the Museum of Vienna. He was a specialist, first and foremost, in oriental carpets. So in the same time that Darwin's evolutionary biology is leveling, if you will, the field, we're all come from the same origins, no more God, no more reason, it's all biological determinism, the art historians are thinking in a similar term of leveling culture, that ornament and the decorative arts are as valuable and important as the high art of the West, that it too has had its own evolution from geometric style to Greek vases to Western illusionism. And uh, Klimt's famous Beethoven frieze, uh, which was also bought by the letters from 1903, it's really a whole narrative of Darwinian evolution and how mankind will come to a higher spiritual realm through evolution and societal progress. So we move from, guess what, Darwin, the gorilla on the top who, who embodies all the evil of the world uh, and the furies, lecheries, lasciviousness, these allegories of vice, grief, the woman who's surrounded by reptilian skin, and into ultimately transcendence. And the, this was all set to Beethoven's uh, heroic symphony, by the way. Uh, and um, uh, this choir of, of, of figures and the embracing couple surrounded by the symbols of procreation. So we switch gears and we look at his society portraits. Already we're dealing with a different stage of evolution. We're in the cultural moment, if you will. This is human representing these women as patron of cultures, the cultural moment in which we are in Vienna. And he's now, he's not depicting these women individuals with uh, biological symbolism and ornament, but with geometric style, including um, uh, backgrounds that Klimt would have seen in Ravenna, Italy when he went there. And then he moves on to other society portraits where he includes a chinoiserie in Chinese art. Uh, Klimt was a great collector of folk art, of Japanese, Chinese art, and African tribal sculpture. Like Regal, he was interested in all the different manifestations of creativity at the time. And Vienna was actually a big gateway for uh, the export and study of Japanese and Chinese art, which they often confused uh, between the two. 
Uh, so these chinoiserie figures are taken from specific objects that Klimt owned. And in fact, the portrait of Elizabeth Lederer that you see here on the right, uh, this veil-like robe behind her is the emperor's Chinese dragon robe. Uh, robe. Mm -hmm. You can see the two blue dragons on either side. And this is all mimicking these imperial robes that Klimt had one. Um, and uh, they were the only the members of the imperial court could wear. This is an allusion to the letterers as the great patrons. So we see in his work this conscious evolution of ornament as well. This is one of the Natsukis that he had in his collection, the portrait of Frederica Maria Beer. These inspired the mask-like um, uh, faces uh, in this portrait. She's wearing, by the way, a Viennese secession garment made by the Wiener Werkstatt of fashion designers. Mm -hmm. Uh, which allows me to return um, and my final uh, points about Regal, the Vienna uh, School of Art Historians. Elizabeth Lederer uh, is standing on a carpet that looks very much like, for those of you who know, a Joseph Hoffman designed Wiener Werkstatt a carpet with the geometric ornaments and the black and white borders. But if you look closely, you'll see these meanders and these green and white discs. Uh, those are by jades. They are um, uh, the highest uh, form of jade uh, objects that were collected. And also, the meanders uh, were thought to come from ancient Greece, but the University of Vienna uh, uh, art historians, there was a big division. Some said that uh, Chinese art had not come out of um, Greek art, because Regal was of a generation that said everything came out of archaic Greece and developed, and the Chinese got the meander from the West. And this is the moment where other art historians were saying, no, the Chinese developed it independently. So it was this great, uh, interesting intellectual fervor at, fervor at this time. And Klimt's uh, proclivity to buy Asian art was also a sign of his openness that not everything had to be Western, uh, that Eastern art or, or Far Eastern art was also of equal value. But I, I just wanted to close with the beholder's share, which we just heard Dr. Kandel talk about. And read some pictures with regard to Regal's theory of the beholder's share. Now you heard about it from the idea of ambiguity and modern art, the way that the brain fires up uh, when it has to resolve uh, ambiguities in order to eliminate details that are extraneous and focus on exactly what that image is. But Regal was not writing at the time of abstract art. So his theory of the beholder's share came from portraiture, which we also heard about. And he argued his theory of the beholder's share came out of his study of Dutch group portraiture, portraiture from the late 1500s into the 1600s, and particularly um, the tradition of civic portraiture in Holland, which, by the way, he argued that the beholder's share had this kind of civic uh, uh, quality to it, that it was a portraiture typical of evolving Dutch society that engaged citizens that related people to one, one another on, on an equal way. And a classic example which he uses is this Rembrandt, uh, the Syndics of the Cloth Guild, one of the most famous pictures by Rembrandt, which I'm sure you all know. And Regal pointed out that the beholder share is about attentiveness. And we look at faces, we're looking at this portrait, and some of the faces are looking inside at each other. So this Syndic is looking at this one. So there's this interior narrative of people engaging, of faces engaging with one another. But others in the portrait are looking up and out at us. And in fact, the figure on the left is getting out of his chair as if someone has just entered the room. And he's acknowledging that fact and turning. Of course, that person is us, as we, the spectators. So there's an interior uh, beholder's share going on within characters within the picture, and that exterior uh, one as well, which engages the spectator directly. Um, and we see this going on, again, Klimt would have been aware of these theories in the details of his picture. So for example, she's looking squarely at us, she's addressing us, her gaze is meeting ours. But if you look at the little chinoiserie figures, they're addressing her. She's like a princess. One is holding up a light to shine on her, and this warrior figure has his hands in his garment in a gest uh, gesture of deference. So just like in the Cloth uh, Syndic's guild picture, we have these interior characters who are addressing the figure inside, and then we have those who are addressing you on the outside, beholding you. So you 
the viewer aware of being beheld as well in this new psychological engagement in the portrait. And this is true of the portrait of uh, Frederica Maria Beer as well, because some of the uh, warrior figures are engaging with each other and a couple are, are looking out at you, as is she. Um, so I just end with this provocative pairing of Judy Chicago's um, uh, dinner table and one of Klimt's uh, female figures masturbating uh, to um, say that they may not be, they may be very different, <laughs> they're a century apart or more, uh, but leading us back into this um, the fact that Klimt and Viennese society at this time was engaged in issues of female sexuality that in fact improved to be quite prescient. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.